Good morning. Greetings in the precious name of Jesus this morning. I hope you all do well in your Christian walk and uh, worshiping God and living for him. As we know, we live in a world that is, uh, in one sense, we would say it's not getting any better. Uh, if you look at the world condition, world situation, but if we uh, look just at our own life, in our own community, perhaps we would say life is, is good and, and it's just very good. But in, in, in many ways, we are very, very sheltered from uh, the way it is in a big part of the world. And as, as I said, it is a dark world that we're living in, and yet we can gather in this way and listening to the Word of God and, and worshiping God together, singing and praising God, and uh, of His goodness we can sing, we can talk about the goodness of God. And perhaps some of you might have heard this as well, this week again, talking about the darkness of this world. Again, the world was exposed to more darkness again this week than maybe this past week than maybe anyone else ever has seen or heard of before. You know, I'm, I don't want to go into this, but you know what I'm talking about, perhaps. Talking about France. Uh, France is a, maybe, in a sense, a troubled country already. But to have these big uh, Olympics there and, and the darkness that is happening, it is truly sad what's happening in, the, on these, in these areas. And that's why I was sharing of the goodness of God and that we can be in the presence of, of God and with fellow believers worshiping and praising God together because we truly have a purpose in this life. So many people live purposeless in this life, uh, communicated and connected many times with people that, that are searching for purpose in life. What is my purpose in life? What is, what is the purpose of life? And brothers and sisters, as people that have called out of darkness, out of the world, into the marvelous light, into the fellowship of God, we indeed have a purpose and that is first of all to lift up the name of our Lord Jesus Christ his goodness and who he is for us and therefore we have to live the life as we heard this this um, Sunday morning in our Sunday school class our lesson was out of the book of James and maybe sometimes almost a little bit hard to understand the book of James uh, what the meaning exactly is of some of the statements that the apostle makes and yet I believe what he's challenging us simply the message uh, in a whole, it like combined the, the, what's his emphasis in, in the book. I believe it is to live the life that we're called to live. It's not so much to call in, into the new life. As we know, we, we, we are, when we become born again, we talk to people and we preach the gospel for people to receive Jesus Christ and become born again. But then once a person is born again, scripture also has a lot to say about how to live the new life that we've been called into. And that is the emphasis of the message this morning. I call the message a spiritual discipline. I don't know if that is, uh, maybe there would have been a better title, but, but the Christian life is a disciplined life. And it is in twofold. It is, we have to cultivate the virtues of a life, the spiritual virtues, we have to cultivate them so they can grow. And at the same time, we have to work with, with the evil side or the bad things in our life and continue to weed, we could say, weed the, the bad habits or weed laziness out of our life. You know, simply weeding the bad habits and laziness out of our life that hinder us to serve God. So this morning I want to first of all talk about um, cultivating the spiritual values and virtues in our life. So I'm not talking about so much about, or not at all, about becoming born again, the gospel message. It's rather once you have been born again, how to continue to live on and to be a valuable, uh, valuable tool in God's hand or to be productive in God's kingdom. Because sometimes I think we are hindered with too much laziness in God's kingdom. It's like a simple illustration we can make if there's a business and they hire a lot of people. But after a person is hired and after a couple of weeks, the, the owner, the boss might notice this one person that I hired seems to be pretty lazy. He doesn't, 
he doesn't get much done. He likes a lot of talking and, and not really doing the things that he's hired to do. And so the employer would, find, would be a little bit disappointed in this employee that he had hired. And that's just an illustration to compare to what I'm talking about. What about Christ when he accepts us into his kingdom? Uh, you know, we become born again, we come into the kingdom. And are we active in the kingdom? Because Jesus himself says his father is glorified if we bear much fruit. So in other words, because everything we have comes from God. So whatever we do, whatever we, whatever we can do, you know, even Jesus says, without God, I can do nothing. And we must realize the fact as well, we on our own, we can't do anything. Whatever we do is all for God's glory. And so that's what I want to talk about this morning, that we cultivate and we take perhaps a personal examine. And, and you know, we, we, it's not that we gain salvation by doing things. That's not what I'm talking about here this morning. I'm simply talking about as a Christian, as a follower, as a professing Christian, how is our walk with the Lord? You know, do we walk in the light? Do we, um, are we an example of the way we live and who we are in this dark world? You know, I believe also by cultivating uh, these spiritual virtues, uh, godly virtues, that uh, strength or, strengthens our Christian walk. It can strengthen our connections with God because we discipline ourselves uh, to do certain things, and we discipline ourselves and do certain things, and we don't do certain things. We do some things, and we do not do some things. Uh, that strengthens our Christian life uh, because, uh, well, first of all, let's take an example of Jesus Christ himself. This is just for an introduction here, where um, Jesus Christ himself, it says in Mark 1, 35, it says, the next morning Jesus walked alone before daybreak, and went out alone into the wilderness to pray. So this is what I'm talking about. It is, it is spiritual discipline. Getting up early in the morning and going by yourself and spending time in prayer to connect with God for a day. You know, if we neglect these things, uh, we neglect something precious. And we neglect something that strengthens our relationship with God. And makes us productive. Again in Luke 5, 16. Jesus withdrew. Again, Jesus withdrew himself from the public. Or from the people that were always around him. And again, he went into the wilderness. And he prayed. So Jesus, as God. Yet he lowered himself. He became human. He took upon him the form of a man. That's why he needed to do the same things as what we need to do. To withdraw ourselves from the business of life. And to spend time with God. And every one of you that is, that is busy in the kingdom knows this. The importance of spending time alone with God. And the, more, the busier you get in the kingdom work, the more time you need to spend alone with God. That's where you receive cr um, strength. That's where you receive, again, strength and wisdom. How you go on in, for the day. How... How to proceed in life. And Jesus, before he started his ministry, he went by himself. And the scripture says in Matthew, 40 days he spent alone in the wilderness. He was fasting. And, um, and then how Satan came and tempted him. And he had the strength to withstand the temptations of, of the devil. <clears throat> so spiritual discipline is to develop strength for the inner man. Um, well, what, what are the things that we need to exercise? Paul talks about his exercising, spiritual exercise. Physical exercise benefits only a little, but the spiritual exercise is profitable. Now, we could ask ourselves the question, how, you know, love is the greatest in the scripture. This Bible will teach us. Uh, you know, though we speak with the tongues of man and angels and have no charity, I am become a sounding breast or a thingling symbol. So what Paul teach, teaches in the Corinthians chapter 13 is doesn't matter what we do, what we all say, how well my speech is, how well your speech is, and what, 
how much time we, we give for the kingdom, if we still don't have love, we're just a tingling symbol. In the case, we're still empty. We have nothing if we don't have love. Charity, which is love, and God is love. If we have love, it's because we have love, received love from God. It also teaches in Colossians 3.14 that above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfection. Love is the bond of perfection. So how is my love, first of all, how is my love towards God? You know, if you would do a test on yourself, grade yourself from 1 to 10, 10 being very strong in love, 1 being very weak. So from 1 to 10, how would you grade yourself? How's, how's my love towards God? Maybe, is it 7 or is it 8? Or is it 2? I believe how strong our love is for God will be evident in how we live for God and how much time we have for the kingdom, how much how much do we witness? How much do we um, rejoice in, uh, in sharing the gospel and, or whatever, encouraging someone? We, you know, we have different gifts. We will do it in a different way. I, we all understand it. Some have the gift of speaking. Some have the gift of serving. Some have, you know, different kinds of gifts. But how is my love for God? Let's ask us that question to self, ourselves this morning. Do we need to cultivate love? And I believe it's a, many times it's a choice to love those that are not easy to love. You know, sometimes you meet people, they're not e so easy to love. Some are very easy to love, some are not as easy to love. But as Christians, we are to love regardless, you know, not to make a, a perspective of person. So we, de need, we need to develop love. Love is God. Secondly, we need to cultivate integrity. What is integrity? Integrity is simply that our speech is accurately truthful. When we deal with money, we are honest. When we buy or sell, we are honest. Um, that's a high level of integrity because even the world expects Christians to be honest. Have you ever noticed that it seems like sometimes the world sets a higher standard for us as Christians as what what they do for themselves. I've experienced that in my life. And rightly so. They're not doing wrong by doing so. Because our standards should be higher. We should be honest and faithful and true what we're saying. And so that's integrity. And the scripture says, Proverbs 22 verse 1, A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches, and long favor rather than silver and gold. So what he's telling us here, a good name of, that a good name is a name of integrity is rather to be shown than silver and gold. You know, we, we keep our word even if it's costing me money. Even if it's costing me something, I still will keep my word. I like that little story that uh, uh, a lot of you know this man, Al Friesen. He, he, uh, he's actually out of Manville here originally, right? And he speaks a lot. Uh, he passed away already, but he spoke a lot on, on family life. And so he had a lot of stories of himself and his father growing up and one of the illustrations that he made, uh, or story, he went with his father to Winnipeg one day, and they were selling a cow. So they had a cow in, a, in the back of a pickup truck, and they were taking a cow to the slaughterhouse. And he was a schoolboy, and that day he had the opportunity to, to ride with his father to Winnipeg. They were taking a cow to, the, to some slaughterhouse. And so the buyer comes out, and he sees the cow from one side, and um, the buyer offers him a price, and the father accepts the price. Uh, but the father knows, his father knows that the cow on the other side has, there's something wrong with the cow from the other side, and the buyer had not seen the other side of the cow. But his father just takes the money, and they go into the city. But then soon his father talk, starts to talking about, I feel bad because I know the buyer did not see the other side of the cow. And the cow had a mistake. I don't know what it was. Did have a, 
bruised or something was wrong on the other side. Anyway, the buyer had not seen it before he paid for the cow. And uh, it bothered the father. It bothered his father. And he is a schoolboy. He kind of had the idea, you know, his father, why are you worrying about it? You got the money, be happy, let's go shopping and let's go home. But it, he, all day it bothered his father. And so finally, his father turns around, goes back to the slaughterhouse, and he's searching out the buyer. Where is the buyer? And it takes him two hours until they find a buyer. And finally they do find a buyer. And he walks up to them and, and his father apologizes. You didn't see the cow from the other side. I know the cow had, a, had, a, had something wrong on the other side, had a sore or something was wrong on the other side and you didn't see it. And I'm here to offer you some money back. If you want to have some money back, I'm willing to pay back. Oh, the buyer said, I never, you know, whatever. I don't know exactly how the buyer responded, but it was something like, oh, he never seen an honest man like this. And anyway, the buyer, I think, the way I remember the story, he refused to take the money back but he really was amazed of a man that was dishonest. And he was a little schoolboy, and he was riding along all day with his father. And he, you know, don't you think a little schoolboy, you know, 10, 12, 13 year old, whatever, is learning something that day from his father? The importance of integrity. The importance of being honest. And you know, I'm just including that story because that's such a local story and it illustrates the point I'm trying to say here. Um, just to be that honest. The next thing that we need to be cultivating in our personal life is joyfulness. And as we talked a few Sundays ago, and I think again it was in our Sunday school or somewhere, about joy has to have a foundation. Joy comes out of something. If I just want to have a joy because I want to have a good life, I want to have joy, and the Bible tells us, after all, rejoice. And again, I say rejoice. Paul is teaching this, right? Rejoice. But we, know to know, we need to know why we rejoice. What's the basis of my joy? If I don't have a base for my joy, my joy is an empty thing. Like, it, it can fly away. Like, like, the wind would blow, and your joy just would fly away. It has no foundation has no joy joy is the result or the consequence of something and that is if our faith is rooted and grounded in the Lord and that is what Paul's teaching after all that he had taught to Thessalonians he says rejoice evermore I uh, rejoice evermore he says to the Thessalonians and to the Philippians he says rejoice and again I say rejoice and also Peter talks about that we rejoice because of the grace of God. So the Bible is, has many verses that teach us that we have joy. So it's a, like almost, it sounds like a command that we ought to have joy, but we are, we are to know why we rejoice. Just having joy because we want to have joy without any roots, without any foundation is an empty joy that might fly away. But if our joy is established on who Christ is and what Christ has done for me, it does not fly away. Even though we go through hardships, even though through difficulties, there's a joy that remains in us because Christ does not change. The foundation is laid and no other foundation can be laid than that what is laid. And that is the joy in the Lord. Rejoice in the joy in the Lord, as it says in Psalms 97, verse 12, Rejoice in the Lord, ye righteous, and give thanks, remembrance of holiness. Give, rejoicing in the Lord and give thanks in remembrance of holiness. So that brings us to the next point, that we cultivate thankfulness in our personal lives. It's so easy to grumble and to be ungracious and unthankful, but in reality, we have to remind ourselves we have so much reason to be thankful. First of all, who, for again, what Christ has done, who he is, and then also for all the blessings that he showers upon us so abundantly in the past and today, and we trust also into the future. But then also one other thing we can rejoice for, that is for the promises that Christ has in the scripture for us. How often do we rejoice for the promises that Christ has in the scripture for us? Well, you might wonder, what are the promises? The promises I'm talking about is like, for example, John chapter 14, where Christ tells his disciples, I'm going away and I'm going to prepare a place for you. 
I'm preparing a place for you. And once I have it prepared, pre prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will receive you that ye may be where I am. Brethren and sisters, is that a reason to rejoice? Is that a reason to be thankful? If we're not thankful for such a promise as this, then I'm afraid there is no reason to be grateful. Because our Creator, our Savior, tells us that He's preparing a place for us and He will come again and He will receive us. So we have a lot of reasons to be thankful, to praise Him, uh, that we uh, praise our Creator, as also we read, and even in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, I want to read a couple of verses. Deuteronomy 30, or one verse, Deuteronomy 32, verse 43, it says, Rejoice, O ye nations, says a plural, nations, with his people. So who is his people? That's Israel. So all nations are to rejoice with his people, for he will avenge the blood of his servants and will render vengeance to his adversaries and will be merciful unto his land and to his people. So he's talking about rejoice nations because the Lord will take revenge of those that take the blood of his people. In other words, those that have shed the blood of the saints will be punished by our Heavenly Father. And so righteousness is coming, and that goes right with uh, Galatians, no, with Revelations 19. And maybe I'm getting a little bit off my topic here, but Revelations 19, verse 1, it says, uh, I'll read verse 1, no, verse, uh, chapter 19, verse 1 to 9. It says, and after these things, so this is now what John uh, sees in the revelation of Jesus Christ, and after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great war. The great war is the, the another place she's called a woman. The, the false, um, it's the false religion that will the end time. Uh, the re false religions are uniting and they will influence the governments, the kingdom. Uh, of the world, they go together. But here it says, they will be judged which do corrupt the earth. So here again, the war is corrupting the earth. It's the false religious system is corrupting the world with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. So again, she's the one that's persecuting the church. And verse three, and again, they say, Alleluia. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. So here the smoke of the unrighteous world goes up and the four and 20 elders and the four beasts fell down. The 24 elders in the book of Revelation is the church of Jesus Christ. So the church is in heaven here at this time. They fell down and they worship God and God that is uh, sitting on the throne saying, Amen. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise or God, all ye his saints, all ye his servants, and ye that fear him, both small and great, and I heard, as it were, the voice of a great multitude and as the voice of many waters, so many waters, that is the many people, the nations of the world, and as the voice of the mighty thundering, saying, Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper for the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are true sayings of God. These are the true sayings of God. So what he's talking about, vengeance is coming on the ungodliness that we're seeing in the world today. But he's also saying that glory is coming for the saints. So there is a vast difference. You know, today, we, all the people in the world, they're, they're living together and they're all mixed. And for us as people, it's hard to say who all is a Christian and who is not, who is following God and who is not. We ne don't, not necessarily see that because 
just because we, we're not God and we do not know people well enough. And scripture also teaches us not to judge. But the point is this, what I'm saying, we are all on the way to eternity. And some people are on the narrow way and some are on the broad way. And we all will head for the destination that is appointed for us. Let us be faithful. Let us be, let us be faithful. Let's bear the name of Jesus, not in vain, but in a way that it will be honor and glorifying to him and bearing fruit even in this life. Be ye thankful and praising God. Another thing that we need to cultivate, you know, as we all know, God is blessing us tremendously in this world. We live in a better part of the world that we are also givers with our, with our finances, with our times, with our whatever we God has blessed us with, that we are contributing and not become greedy in this world. Because this is also something that we need to cultivate in our life because we don't, we all of a sudden might become a greedy person. You know, the love of money is the root of all evil. So how much love do I have for the money or for the possessions of this world? And we need to ask ourselves a question. It's not, it's not something that we, Im, we are immune to. No, we are, we, we are very prone to become a little bit sticky to the money or to the love of money or to the pos or possessions. And by being a faithful giver, I think helps us a lot to not become or not be a, a stingy person or a greedy person. But as the scripture teaches us in 2 Corinthians 9, that we are to give according as he hath purposed in his heart, so let him give not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loveth a cheerful giver. A cheerful giver. And then to be neighborly, that we care for our neighbors, and I'll miss that point. And the next point is um, contentment, that we, first of all, ourselves, that we are content with what God, the way God is leading us, and that we also teach contentment to our children. It's, I believe this is, again, a very important virtue that we need to cultivate in our personal lives, and that we also need to teach our children. And actually, all of these points that I'm teaching us, we, we need to practice them in our own life, and then we also need to teach them to our children. Because there's a great value in being content, as Paul tells Timothy. Godliness with contentment is great riches. And we very easily can come into a rut of discontentment. And we're ever, never quite satisfied the way things are. And therefore we, have, we feel like we have a reason to grumble or to complain. And let us not be that people. Let us be that people that are content and grateful, thankful for what God has blessed us with. You know, and that includes our friends, our fellowship, our church. Um, all the blessings that he showers so abundantly upon us. Let's be thankful. Then I also had a few points that we need to weed out um, that truly hinder us. In, in growth, in spiritual growth in our personal lives. As you all know, the parable of the sower, the good sower in, in Scripture, where the good sower goes forth and he's casting out the seed. The seed was all good. The seed was all the same, right? That, he, that the sower was casting out. But the, 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 the soil condition was so different. Some fell on the road in hard places. Some fell under the thorns. And some fell uh, under, under, under rocks, had very little soil, and therefore could not grow. Some fell on, on soil, which was a lot better. It, it yielded 30%. And some fell on very good soil, and it yielded 100%. So the difference was the condition of the soil. And I believe that's a parable of our heart. Whether how much the word of God will do in my heart depends on the condition of my heart. How hard is my heart? How receptive is my heart to receive the word of God and to allow it to do its work in us? And therefore, we have to weed our heart so that we don't have these thorns, these thistles that 
all the weeds growing in our heart because the good seed, when it comes in, it will just choke out. And as we know in the parable, the, the, the thorn is maybe the worry, worries of this, the care of this world and so on. But whatever that weed is in our lives, we need to weed it out so that when we hear the word of God or we read the word of God, that it actually will penetrate our heart that we can grow thereby. Because I just find in my own life, and I, I believe many of you would have a testimony, we would allow you to give you a testimony right now. What, what, what are the weeds in, our, in your heart? Perhaps you all know of some weeds in our heart that actually need to be weeded out. You know, that is simply the cares of this life. Sometimes we are, we are too busy. Sometimes we worry too much about things. And, and that makes the word of God uh, ineffective in our lives. And we do not bear the fruit for God's glory. And the scripture teaches us in the book of Hebrews, uh, 12 verse 1 and 3, lay aside every weight. Uh, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Now, what are these weights? Let us lay aside every weight and let us uh, in every sin. So every weight and every sin, which does so easily beset us, and then he goes on and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. So the laying aside of weights, the laying aside of sin, and then run with patience the way that's set before us. So it's so much easier to run, as you all know, if you don't need to carry a lot of weight. You know, sometimes we see at the school picnics how fast the children can run. But what about if, if even those boys that run the fastest if they had to carry 50 pounds of rock on their back, how hard would it be to win a race with 50 pounds of rock on your back? It would make it very hard. You still could walk, perhaps we could say, but not really run, not really win the race. Now, therefore, free ourselves of the weight that is set before us. And I find in my life, so many times it might be worries, or so many times it might be, how will I, how will I get everything done? You know, over my last number of years, the last eight years or so, you know, just uh, pastoring these churches in, in Western Canada, and it has been such a great blessing, but many times, all of a sudden, it almost wants to overwhelm you. How can we, how can we pastor these churches? New groups starting up and starting up, and, and yet again, again, you marvel if you just commit this to God, you marvel at what God is doing. You know, it's never us. It's never us. But it's God, what God is doing. I'm just talking about my own life. And you all have your own things. Where we need to commit things to God. Sometimes we have a big decision to make about something. And again, worry tends to set in. How will this all turn out? But this is where, I believe God is many times he's testing us. He's testing us. Are we trusting him? Or do we rely on our own understanding? We are not to rely on our own understanding, right? But we are to trust God. So lay aside those weights because they're just hindering us to run this race with patience. Um, another big weight that so easily besets us, and this is something you all have experienced, at least all of those that are mature, and those that have a few years behind you, and that is what uh, Jesus talks about this, about the offenses, and that we are not to offend the little ones. But we, offenses. Paul talks about he's void of offenses. That he, void of offenses, that he will not offend someone else. But I think the same way we also can understand it's not living as someone that has been offended because Paul had done both. He had offended, but he also was offended. And what I find in, in my life, and I think, and that's what I mean, y'all have been offended. Sometimes it feels like when we are offended that I'm the only one that's offended and no one knows what I'm going through. No one knows my experience and, and I'm all alone in this because that's the nature of feeling offended. Uh, and then that's like a weight. It tends to discourage us, or it does discourage us. And 
Jesus' very hard words towards us if we offend someone. Paul says he's void of offenses in, in Acts 24. Um, maybe I should read that verse. Acts 24, verse 16. Um, Paul says, and herein do I exercise myself. So this is an exercise that we need to take. I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense towards God and towards man. Not to be offenders and not to be offended. Uh, it's a terrible, um, it's a terrible, terrible bondage. What I have, I have some experience in my own life and I have dealt with many, many people that have been offended, very, very deeply offended in their heart. Sometimes many, many years ago. And that is, is a very, very real uh, and painful, painful wound, a painful pain, a painful, yeah, a painful heart, uh, caught in the heart. And to help people to work through this, but it's like carrying a weight and it just hinders us to run the race that is set before us. How do we, how do we get healed from offenses by forgiving? Jesus says offenses will come, but woe unto him by whom they come. But if we have been offended, the way out of it again is forgiveness. Sometimes we don't want to forgive because if we forgive, may, makes it seems like it's okay what the other person did. No, that doesn't change anything. It's still wrong what the other person did if I'm offended. But if I forgive, that simply means that I don't need to carry this weight with me anymore and I'm free to run the race with patience. And God will deal with the other person and he will deal between him and God. But it sets me free that I can run this race with patience, that I don't need to carry these weights. It's like if we carry a load of offenses with us and, and I have met dear people with this, they, they've been offended in life so many times and eventually it's like they're pulling a trailer load of rocks behind them. Those rocks are offenses. And they pull this trailer around day in, day out over hills, through valleys of their life, they carry these offenses. And it's just hard pulling. You know, they barely survive themselves because it's a full job just to pull the offenses that they've been offended with. When a person forgives, it's, it's like this. You all know a trailer. A trailer has a pin that attaches the trailer to the tractor, right? That's the way we used to have it on our farm. We had a pin. That's all that attaches the trailer to the tractor. But when you forgive, you pull that pin out. When you pull that one pin out by the grace of God, what happens? The tractor keeps on going, but the load of rocks stay behind. And how easy it is to walk the way of life, how easy it is to run the path that God has laid before us, and we don't need to pull that load of rocks behind us. Well, that's just one illustration. Maybe some of you would have different illustrations. But that's what happens when we can forgive those rocks. That weight uh, stays behind us. <clears throat> you know, there was a little story here of a Jewish man. After he, uh, um, I know I have told the story before. But when, after the Holocaust... The Jewish people were, so many of them were tortured and killed over in Germany and Europe. And uh, so, but one Jew escaped. He came onto a ship and he came to North America. And then before he stepped onto the land in North America, he said, I forgive Adolf Hitler for what he has done to my people in, in Germany because I don't want to carry Adolf Hitler with me anymore. See, as long as we not, don't forgive the offender, we carry the offender with us. He sits on our shoulder all the time. But when we forgive the offender, then all of a sudden, he stays behind and we can walk freely. You know, that's in short, of course, it could be a lot more, it could be said. 
But that is what happens when we can forgive by the grace of God. That makes us free to serve God with greater joy and in a more, in a more beautiful way. Let's stand to pray. Gracious Father, we come to you once again this morning. We want to give you all honor, glory, and praise. Father, we thank you for your word that teaches us how to live the Christian life that you have called us into. You have not called us into this life to continue to live under this weight or in any sin, but you bought us with your own precious blood. You delivered us from this sin. You set us on a new way, on this rock, um, that we can follow Jesus Christ, Father. And we know it's not easy. We, we experience different things. We are offended. We go through valleys, difficult times, God. But we all, always can look up to you and trust that you will lead us faithfully through. Because the scripture promises us that you will be with us even through the valley of death. And God, we just cling to your promises because we know you are faithful and true. And you always will see us through. Thank you, Father. We pray for your blessing on each one in their own personal lives, whatever they're experiencing today. God, you know and you can feel with us, and I pray that we all would find comfort and strength in you. Thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen.